Hey, what's up, gang? My name is Esco Blades. Uh, back with another interview for you guys. I am pleased to be joined uh, by Darby Devitt, who is the lead scriptwriter on Assassin's Creed Revelations, and Falco Polker, who is the mission design director. Did I say that right? It's Poiker, actually. It's Poiker. My yeah. bad. I'm so no, sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to be putting some interview questions to them. Uh, with, uh, we've been at a press event playing the uh, single player. You can look out for my write up on Xbox Game Zone uh, once the embargo lifts. So um, I'm going to start off uh, with a question for Darby, and um, it's basically talking about your role in the 3DS title, uh, Assassin's Creed Lost Legacy. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you're, you're opening the attic. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> well, the question I had was mainly because uh, it seems like that storyline was the foundation for what has become... Part of it. Uh, part of yeah. Yeah. Part of uh, um I just wanted to kind of know, is it, it's so, has there been much change from that? Or, you know, is it kind of like, uh, you know, is it just, was it kind of like a starting point? Yeah, I, I don't know how much I can actually say explicitly, but the, uh, the 3DS game was going to actually go to Constantinople and just be a little bit earlier than this game. Um, but when it came, push came to shove, various decisions were made. Uh, by people far above me that said they didn't want to uh, come out with an Assassin's Creed game on the 3DS at that time, okay. um, but the the idea of Constantinople was a was a was a major one. Our storyline took Ezio there. Mm -hmm. We also had these all this Altair storyline right. mapped out. We knew we wanted to do all this stuff. Um, so this was all while wow, Brotherhood was being made that all this was mapped out. Yeah. Um, we decided uh, at some point, whenever the whenever it was decided, also uh, to do this third Ezio game. We knew already he was going to Constantinople. We just thought, you know what? Let's uh, let's just say we're not going to do the three D story. We'll combine all the stuff that we wanted to do, um, and, and you know, and, and fit it in a way that it fits in the the third console Ezio game. So it's very complicated. I, it would it would take hours to explain like what was kept, what was thrown out. Um, it, it might uh, excite the hardcore fans, but uh, <laughs> but I won't get into it. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks for that. Um, I did want to ask actually, and just more personal question than anything else, with the timeline that we've had with the Assassin's Creed stories, and the both of you could can answer this if you want. Um, how so, uh, how much overlap is there in that? Like, so Assassin's Creed One at one point during the, pro the development of Assassin's Creed, had you then started thinking, right, this is how we're going to go with Assassin's Creed 2? Because I'd heard from a few people at Ubisoft that you've had the whole story mapped out since the beginning. Is that <clears throat> true? Or is it, do you, you know, do you make changes along the way? I don't think uh, people were, were fleshing out the story for Assassin's Creed 2 until Assassin's Creed 1 came out and was such a success. Um, uh, that said, once they started developing Assassin's Creed 2, uh, the character, uh, they would have <clears throat> ideas of where the character could go. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I mean, to say that everything is, is fleshed out, like, right from the beginning, at the beginning, uh, doesn't really make sense because you're going to make adjustments even in the first game. As the first game gets developed, you're going to make changes that would make everything else irrelevant, right? Yeah. You have a general idea of where the story arc is going to go, but as, a, as each iteration comes out, you're like, okay, you know, this Assassin's Creed 2 was was very successful we've got we've got these other story ideas let's take Ezio you know one step further let's bring him to Rome where we knew he went blah 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 uh, in order to have him meet the Borgias which is which is what you know a very interesting thing going on at the mm -hmm. time uh, and then you just start you go into detail and you start you know fleshing out the story and then you know Brotherhood was a big success and they say you know hey you know we were able to pull off Brotherhood let's try one more time let's take this other time period uh, you know in, in Ezio's life and let's flesh that out right so uh, I I mean again uh, I, I wasn't there in the room you know <laughs> so so it's entirely possible that there is a person, you know, at Ubisoft, uh, maybe Corey, who has the entire history of the world of assassins in his head. It's, it's actually more complicated than that. I think it's he, he's correct. Falco's correct in the, when talking about the ancestors, it, but it's more of like a layered thing. Corey has the idea uh, mapped out in his head for the Desmond story, and it's it's because it's a it, it's. The Desmond story is taking place over a very short period of time. Mere weeks go by for every iteration, right? Yeah. So Corey's always had the idea of where he wants Desmond's story to go, but he's always m much more vague about the ancestors, right? And so 
you, we don't start developing the ancestors in, de in depth until we get to them. Um, so, so this idea, you know, a long time ago, people thought, um, said, uh, somebody said, this is a trilogy, right? Um, well, that story of Desmond has just been, we've just been, you know, for these console games, we've just been taking smaller chunks of Desmond's story and unfolding them maybe a little slower than they initially wanted to. But the story of Desmond has been pretty, pretty well mapped out. I think Cor knows where he wanted to take it. But then, yeah, you create a character like Ezio. Now you're like, okay, now let's focus on Ezio. We know how, we know what, how it relates slightly to Desmond's story and needs to involve an apple of Eden, right? These vague sort of details need to bubble up into Desmond's story. But, but until you get to that ancestor, Altair or Ezio or whatever, you, um, then that's when you start working on the Ezio stuff. And a lot of things happen in parallel too. Like it was about a year into AC2's development that my company, the company I was with in Seattle got the call to like, Hey, fans really want a PSP game. Uh, let's yeah. try it, and it's going to involve Altair. So they had all this Altair character. They had some vague things that they knew about him um, that you know weren't in AC1. They said, well, he's, he goes to Cyprus, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that's when I started. So I started writing Bloodlines uh, you know, about a year before AC2 came out, maybe a little bit before. Um, so all these things are being developed in parallel, and you, you feel your way along, but there's always a... There's always a, a, a decent roadmap up ahead, which is the Desmond story. Yeah. So. Okay. That's that's good to hear, actually, because a lot of people, um, I guess, with, with the hardcore fans, ultimately, Assassin's Creed, more Assassin's Creed, we'll take it. But, um, <laughs> you know, a lot of people, there's there's a growing voice that we need to see more of, uh, uh, you know, Desmond, and we need to see more of the Desmond sections. And I actually have uh, a couple of questions about that. Uh, the first being, of obviously, the Black Room. Now that's you know been introduced in Revelations and the design and the layout. I wanted to know if it's um, sort of those gameplay sections. Are they going to be just linear in that you literally just have to go point to point, or are we going to have you know a bit more of a sort of free roam to 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 develop <coughs> that side of the story and mm. kind of save Desmond from going mad? <laughs> the gameplay sections uh, that Desmond. Uh, that are available in the Desmond storyline are linear. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're explorations of his subconscious and his past, and uh, they're kind of very surreal gameplay. Uh, it's something that no one has ever seen before. Yeah. So Throw out everything you sort of yeah. know about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, so it'd be hard for even for me to describe what, what it looks like. You'd have to really see it uh, in the end. Uh, having said that, it's uh, it's really going to delve into uh, Desmond's backstory um, and and him personally. Uh, but in terms of like doing an Assassin's Creed type of gameplay, you know, uh, free running and stuff like that uh, with Desmond, uh, that's not happening in okay. Revelations. All right, awesome. Straight to the point. <laughs> um, I was going to ask in a previous Game Informer interview, I believe. Uh, Falco, you you'd uh, said uh -oh. that <laughs> you'd said uh, you were you were looking to make improvements to sort of like the crowd mechanics. Now, uh, kind of more GTA esque was what I got from that anyway. Um, so with random events happening with the population, mm -hmm. and um, so I've seen a little bit of it. But obviously, did, this you, is get, did you get stabbed by a stalker? Yes, I did. <laughs> that was that was so surreal. <laughs> somebody running at me, and I thought he wanted some money. He was getting ready to throw out some money from a pouch, and then he. Turned around and I couldn't do anything, and he stabbed me. Yep. And I was on like two bars of health anyway, so I was nearly dead. <laughs> I just saw <laughs> the great Ezio being stabbed by a stalker. But um, with regards to those, what 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 can we sort of expect to see? I mean, I was going to say that this interview is going to be going up before the embargo is lifted, so right. I can't really talk about what I've seen. But what can you tell us about you know those? Crowd mechanics. Well, you just talked about what you just saw, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I brought it up. Yeah, well, yeah. So I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> um, uh, basic. I mean, at, in, every time we make a new Assassin's Creed, uh, people like me uh, look at the crowd and keep wanting to make the crowd more alive and less of a game mechanic. I mean, if you go back and you look at Assassin's Creed One, um, uh, it was even it was even shown to be a main game uh, a game. Blah, it was even shown to be a game mechanic, uh, you know, in, in the tutorial at the beginning, you have the, the women with their jars on their heads and stuff like that, and if you bump them, they crash and the guards will see you and stuff like that, right? And, uh, and like, I mean, what's, what's powerful about it is that it's a game mechanic that looks like it's a lived-in city, right? Uh, at the same time, 
uh, after you've played 30, 40 hours of the game, you you see less of the people and you see more of the mechanic, and you you, you want to get there's past a repetition. That. Yeah. Exactly, there's a repetition, and so um, so what we've done is uh, we did this in in uh, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood to an extent as well uh, with the ambushes, the, the thieves ambushes, and we've got you know we've got Templar ambushes in our game, and then we've added the stalker uh, who will come out of nowhere and take you out. And do you hear? Wh- I think you hear whispers. You do. Yeah. yeah. We we took a kind of multiplayer um, mechanic that where as you hear him approaching, you yeah. start to hear whispers, just like you would hear an approaching a that's bad guy in multiplayer. So it's. Yeah. And so I did. I did pick up on the whispers. Actually, yeah. I was. Did thinking, you? Yeah, that's, as, that's, a, that's as a multiplayer <laughs> character, we were like, wait a second, is this demon song? Did somebody, <laughs> did somebody invade my game? Uh, <laughs> so uh, so yeah. So what we've done is we've got a couple uh, missions in the game that that are just. They're just happening in the okay. city, and you can walk right by if you want, or, or you can take part. Um, you've got uh, you've got the stalker, um, and then uh, and then also what we've done is we've made it so that the mission givers are doing things uh, when you go up and talk to them, so that instead of just being static and you know being, again a game mechanic. Uh, no, these are actual people. Uh, you know, a, a merchant who's actually you know rifling through mm-hmm. his stuff, and, and you walk up to him, and he turns and starts talking to you. Um, so it's always uh, with the goal of making a, a what we call the living, breathing world. Like that is, for me, the ultimate goal is, is if we can somehow, and you know, this would require a, like quite a complex uh, AI, I guess, mm-hmm. is make it so that every single person looks in, individual, and if you follow, if you just chose one person and you follow him around and he goes and talks to people and stuff like that i mean that is my ultimate and obviously yeah. it's just impossible right now so you know we have little missions here and there that get triggered we have little you know we have special characters that come out of nowhere and do things and um and uh that's how we enhance the uh the realism of of the, of the city from a from a writing standpoint too i worked really hard and i don't know what to what extent they did this in brotherhood but it was very important for me uh, and the, the AI writer, Nick Grimwood. He, he writes all the like lovely crowd dialogue and heralds shouting. Oh, yeah. He and I sat down and mapped out every single sequence. Um, um, I wanted to get this because one of the back stories is that um, the Sultan Bayezid is fighting his son Selim over control of the, uh, the throne, basically. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to give the sense of progression that the war was getting closer and closer to Constantinople. Someone was winning, then they were losing, then these kinds of things. So we mapped out like every single sequence. It, the heralds say, you know, report on the progress. So almost as if in, in Hamlet you always hear the progression of Fortinbras coming closer and closer to Helsingar Castle. We wanted to do that. So, so it gives the player a little bit like if they want to take some breather, some downtime and just l- listen to the crowd. They'll actually hear a, a kind of a, a story going on in the background, and uh, that was important to us as well. Mm. That's that's pretty good, actually. That's great to hear. Um, right, this is sort of a community question. Uh, there's been a lot of talk or debate about Altair, the Altair sequences that we've you know we've seen in various trailers and whatnot. And um, a lot of people pointed out that he shouldn't be able to do his air assassinations <laughs> and what's going on here. So. Is that a conscious decision? Uh, is or is more the question I want to ask is: Is there a reason for that in the game? Is that explained, or is that something you can tell us now? Um, um, Altair actually developed uh, the move, the the uh, the jump, uh, the, the what's it called again? What's the technical air assassination? Thank you, the air assassination. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm bad with names. I'm I'm good at my job. I'm bad at names. <laughs> And um, he developed the the move um, because if you look at the codexes, uh, codices, is that right? <laughs> that is. Codex, codex pages. Codex, codex pages. <laughs> it's one codex. Oh, it's one codex. The but codex he, he pages. He compiled from many different years. Okay. It's a greatest hits of Altair's writing <laughs> that he gave to Niccolo Polo. So if you if you read the greatest hits of Altair. <laughs> Uh, you'll see that there's one entry, I think it's 13, anyway, I don't know what number it is, uh, where he says he's discussing different techniques uh, with uh, with Malik, different assassination techniques, and uh, and that's where he makes the mention of the air assassination. And that's, I, in in Brotherhood, uh, sorry, not in Brotherhood, in AC2, um, that's, or Assassin's Creed 2, sorry, um, I'm using our code names. <laughs> Um, that's where uh, Ezio will unlock the ability to do the air assassination. Um, and uh, for me, it was just a matter of, you know, hey, uh, Altair came up with that. Um, and here you place Altair in a situation where 
and it's young Altair, and so he's you know brash and crazy and stuff like that. You put him in a situation where it's very extreme. There's an army attacking his hometown, uh, and <laughs> he decides to single-handedly save the city. And in, when you put someone in an extreme situation, they're gonna do things that are pretty creative. So my take on it is. Uh, that that was where he came up with the move, uh, and uh, and then kind of you know like decided to sort of you know train it and officialize it with Malik uh, later on in his life. Um, that's my explanation. Uh, clearly, we didn't have the move in uh, Assassin's Creed One. Um, so, you know, people can still say, oh, uh, I'm full of shit because, I'm sorry, am I allowed to say that? <laughs> yeah, they're fine. That's fine. <laughs> um, we're not on TV uh, that I'm full of shit. I'm just, uh, you know, but, you know, why not? You know, yeah. why couldn't he have come up with that move in, in this stress stressful situation and then said, hey, that's a cool idea. I'm going to work on that when Maybe I Maybe it was time. the first time he ever used it. Yeah. And, because it, we, we kind of want that m moment to be the time where he, where where uh, Amalan singles him out as like, you are indeed a master assassin. Yeah, like you, and so Al 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 And that's when he starts to really become cool. a little arrogant. Like, uh, he's actually fairly short with Abbas at the beginning of that mission uh, um, in an earlier scene. But, you know, you, as soon as you start catch the eye of your mentor, you start to, you know, and you be yeah. he becomes the arrogant guy that he is at the beginning of AC1. If I can pivot off that for a moment. Yeah, sure. there's I, I, I read the forums all the time, and I really love seeing these debates among fans. There's so many of them. There's why are they called Byzantines when that word wasn't coined until a few hundred years later? Why, should, why aren't they called Eastern Roman Empire or yeah. denizens? Um, why is uh, did we just make up the fact that Altair and Ezio aren't directly related? Um, th these are all questions that we very, very carefully considered for a long time. You know, we call them Byzantines because it's uh, we want people to go directly from the game to to Wikipedia and look this up. And for clarity's sake, we just left Rome. We don't want to call them Romans. Yeah. There's certain little things we do that we we there's an incredible amount of debate in the office about what should we do. Um, should we be totally historically accurate, or should we be? Should we lose? Uh, so, uh, what do you call it? Uh, manipulated a little bit for gameplay reasons or for clarity reasons. Or so, all these things are very, very carefully considered. I haven't seen anything on the forums, uh, anything major that we haven't like had really passionate arguments about, and we always come to a decision for a very specific reason. Um, um, because we're keeping an eye on this all the time. Uh, and uh, so we're just as passionate mm -hmm. as the fans, and we uh, we really we actually really love these spirited debates. Yes. Um, we wish, like sometimes, or I do anyway, that I could actually like just float into the <laughs> forum and start answering everyone's questions. But we're really just trying to make a, a, a good game, yeah. and and we we're confident that people will love it uh, when it comes out, and that all their fears will just evaporate yeah. after a while. So to directly <laughs> answer your initial question, though, <laughs> the reason why we have. Uh, Altair do a Mook assassinate before uh, Assassin's Creed 1 is because you know when when I was when we were developing the mission and I was playing the mission and I got to that spot and I looked down and I saw that guy from where I was I said <laughs> he's got to do a Mook assassinate yeah. here this is just the coolest thing well and keep and when, in mind that you, that's, you don't have sorry, to do air assassinate. Way. no you don't have to that, I mean so hey you know players who want to be accurate they don't have to do that. There's a, there's definitely a few <laughs> paths to that mission too. Like yeah. In that's the funny thing is we always play these demos right where we do a specific path and then people go like oh it's so, so linear it's like that whole courtyard is open for you. Yeah. There's yeah. a couple of different ways to do that. It's that. linear because we're demonstrating it to, <laughs> to exactly. hundreds of people and so we have to be able to do it every single time, time yeah. uh, yeah. without making any mistakes. Plus we need like you know certain people who are. Who aren't so good at the game? They practice one path that they're gonna have to demo yeah. for somebody. We're we're super experts. Yeah. Some might not be. In. I've been playing the game a lot. <laughs> uh, anyway, I uh, I mean, we like as you can tell, we can go on about this even this one issue for a really long time. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, what it really comes down to is you know. Altair developed the move, so it's totally plausible that he did that move. So sure. that's really what it comes down to at that point. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so here's another one. And this cropped up. Altair won't have a tank. <laughs> no tank. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you heard it here first. <coughs> um, Exclusive. <laughs> uh, there was another one that cropped up, and it was with regards to what um, what uh, you know, Ezio is called in the game. Now it's called uh, Inomentore. And... Uh, 
you know somebody that oh, I was just reading this the other day. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I I commented in that thread actually, yeah. and somebody had said, oh, "Are you on so, the Ubisoft forums?" Oh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, in a big way. And uh, you know, somebody had said, "So he's a master assassin, but he's not." You know the grand master of the assassin order and um somebody comes in and goes oh there's different you know yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. orders all all over the place do you want to just clarify yeah. that scene as you we, saw the thread i actually worked on the encyclopedia which clarifies a lot of this uh the phrase mentor in the past um applied to uh any assassin who had reached a master assassin level um and had achieved an extraordinary level of skill, wisdom, and had taken on a number of apprentices, okay. and that's basically where you reach with uh, um, with with Ezio and the end of Brotherhood. The reason why it's not the Grand Master of the entire Order is simple: back then, uh, communication between yeah. two different countries or two different continents was extremely slow, um, especially at, in 1511. Like uh, actually, Falco and I read a book called The Fourth Part of the World. Um, that talks about um, how uh, communication and, and cartography slowly opening up the world to uh, people. And uh, you have to remember that not many Europeans had been to China uh, by 1500, mm -hmm. you know, um, or like just around 1400 people start getting curious about, let's go over to China, but nobody knows anything about it, just these, you know, rare travelers. So, and yet we... In our universe, we have assassin guilds everywhere, right? Because they are an ancient order, right? Yeah. So it would make sense that they're scattered over. So for us, a mentor at this time is is a, a much more provincial kind okay. of title. Yeah. He's the mentor for the Italian assassins. Um, and uh, by the 20th century, though, by, or the end of the 19th, we, by the time you get to, like, the fall comic books, there is the mentor who has become more of an official uh, title. Because communication in the world is now, these assassins, clans can all become part of one big family, kind yeah. of. We try to, you know, that was that was hammered out a little while ago because we knew we were, we were, got we, you know, with especially with the fall, we were we were going pretty far, and you know, the the Russian Revolution is yeah. 19th, the 20th century, early 20th century. So you know, we made some decisions a while back about what these terms meant, and that was that was what we uh, sort of solidified. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for that.